Hello world, what's up? This is your boy Reggie Dokes and I welcome you to the seventh episode of God Said Give Them Drum Machines Behind the Scenes podcast. Isn't that great? Episode seven, we are just moving right along. And you know, I just wanna take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you guys for just supporting us and being with us on this journey. However, I'm not alone today. You know, um, I got uh, my good folks, Jennifer Washington and David Grandison, both of whom are producers on the documentary. God said, give them drum machines. They are my my teammates today for this episode. And so speaking of episode in this one, we will be talking to Detroit photographer Emmett Nicholas. OK, so Emmett was one of those smart guys that had a camera around his neck during all the various uh, dance scenes in Detroit, Club 246. I mean, I could just go on and on. He was there and he had a camera around his neck and he was taking pictures. So this brother is on our show today and he's going to be sharing with us his journey as a photographer and a lot of the great moments that he caught uh, on film. My name is Emmett Nicholas. I am a contributing photographer to the documentary God Said Give Them Drum Machines. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I've lived in Los Angeles, Houston, Dallas, and Detroit. And my passion is video, audio, and filmmaking. Awesome. And how did you get into all of this? Okay, let's see. I guess it all starts back at uh, at Wayne State. Me and my buddy were going there, and uh, I had switched over to communications. He told me, he said, Emmett, you need to get you a camera. So I went and bought this VHS video camera that was about the size of a microwave oven today. And I started going around and shooting some of the DJs that were playing house music in Detroit. I videotaped uh, Norm Talley, Al Esther, Stacy Hot Wax Hell, and I think I got some footage of Delano somewhere. It was kind of just going around using a camera and just making something happen. It, it's kind of funny because somehow a guy named Will Phelps hired me to shoot my, to shoot some video of his house music parties that he was giving at the time. And he was the first person to hire me outside of my family. And, uh, you know, I got some usable stuff. It wasn't the best, but I could always frame a shot very well. But uh, so this was late 80s like 87, 88, somewhere in that ballpark. And uh, I think a guy he had playing for him was uh, Tony Hunter. And uh, I got some footage of him somewhere. And uh, that's how that whole thing kind of kind of snowballed. Uh, then I helped another guy do a, uh, a party at the uh, it was building on the uh, boulevard just east of uh, Woodward, I forgot the name of it. I think it was called the 20 Grand or something. Or, But uh, it was a fashion party, and Hump the Grinder was the host. And some guy hired me to shoot some footage for him. And I don't know how he found out about me. Uh, I haven't seen the guy since. That's been over 30 years. And... Uh, it just kind of, you know, word of mouth, uh, going out, shooting, and, you know, back then, you know, if you had a camera back then, that was a big deal. You know, now everybody has a camera, 
on their telephone. So I have this footage, like I said, from the mid to late eighties and uh, VHS quality. And uh, it's kind of funny because I've started the, uh, turning it into digital. And uh, some of the stuff I just totally forgot about because, you know, it's been 30 years and some of the people, some are not here, a lot of them still are, but uh, it's just, it captured a moment in Detroit House in that mid to late 80s time frame. And it's funny to look back at all the fashions, the cars, some of the venues that were uh, hot at the time, you know, 246. Uh, it's one of the spots where Will Phelps threw some of his uh, house parties. And it kind of grew from there. Then I graduated from Wayne State in 1990 and I shot straight to LA and got into uh, sound recording and uh, did some freelance when I first got there, worked some odd jobs and uh, hooked up with some people. Uh, actually through uh, my aunt, I ended up landing a sound job at BET from like 90, I think it was 93 to like 97 or 98, somewhere around there. And that truly was the, uh, that job with uh, Black Entertainment TV was the most fun uh, enjoyment I've had at a job in my life. I mean, I was paid to go to events that, you know, people would give their right arm to go to. I had to go to the cover the Oscars, the Grammys, the Soul Train Awards. I met people like Milton Berle, Quincy Jones, uh, Halle Berry, Pam Greer. And uh, it's funny because while I was out there, I ran into Christian Hill on a video shoot. Uh, I was at, uh, I think it's a place on Wilshire, Wilshire Ebell Theater, I think it is. And I hear this, someone call my name but I'm not facing this. I recognize the voice, but I'm saying, how could that be Christian? And I turned around, it was Christian Hill. And uh, that had to be, oh my gosh, that had to be like 95, 1995, somewhere in there. You know, this was long before his project got started, but uh, we kind of kept in contact, but you know, his schedule, and my schedule, we never really hooked up out there, which is kind of ironic because we end up hooking up back here for his uh, project that uh, you and him are putting together. And uh, it's funny how the world revolves, you know, around video production and people. Yeah, you just really like painted a picture for me, you know, and it's just a trip. What high school did you go to? I went to uh, U of D Jesuit High School. Yeah, that was... Uh, Right there on Seven Mile, yeah, in Cherry Lawn. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's it, 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 here's something else that's kind of strange in the whole thing. I recorded the uh, DJ contest that Mojo had on for the house music DJs. And one night, I threw a tape in my cassette deck, and who pops up on the radio but Christian Hill. So I recorded his mix, eventually gave it to him, you know, years later. And it's just so ironic that I would record his mix that far back and then we would hook up so down the road. Oh, my God, that is hysterical. Yeah. And I still have the cassette in my stash somewhere. And uh, Christian grew up on Snowden. I grew up on Littlefield. I think it's eight houses between his house and my house. So it's wow. a small world and a strange world, but uh, it's a great world too. Um, when you can hook up with people, contribute to a project like this, because I've, I've had this VHS tape. I mean, I took it from Detroit to LA, to Houston, to Dallas, back to Houston and back to Detroit before I did anything with it because the technology wasn't there really. It was so expensive, you know, but now you can, buy the software, it's almost free or very inexpensive. And you can transfer all your uh, 
analog assets. Uh, for Christian, I recorded his audio on a cassette. Oh, the VHS was the stuff with uh, Will Phelps and the DJs and Stacy and Norm DJing at, at, at a variety of places in Detroit. Like, uh, I remember 246 was one spot. Uh, I'd have to look at the tapes on the labels. You know, it's so funny because back then, you know, I didn't, didn't really have a vision. I mean, I knew I wanted to do something with this footage. But, you know, that was mid to late 80s. The technology was not really there. Um, or it was very expensive. And I didn't quite have a vision to how to put it together. But I did know this. I did know to keep it and to, you know, take care of it. Because uh, my grandfather said, look, this, you know, sometimes you have to get out there and take a chance and start something. You, you, might, you might not know where you end up with it, but sometimes you just have to roll the dice. Like my buddy said, M, buy a camera. When I got back to Detroit, I got, I got back to Detroit in 2002. And I started shooting the buildings of downtown because I, I love architecture. And then that transitioned into the house music scene. People that I have seen play in high school, college, uh, you know, still out there, kicking out tracks, throwing parties. So I, uh, I started shooting the DJs at the various parties. And 20 years later, I have shot about 90... DJs uh, from Detroit, Chicago, New York, some from overseas, some really big names, some not so big names. And, uh, you know, there was really no plan for this. I just did it and uh, have a wide, um, a very wide collection of DJs. Uh, I mean, it's like, Eight, it's, it's, it's almost about 85 DJs in total over 20 years. Most of the photos are, are digital. But I, when I started out, I had a, a, I don't know what kind of camera I had. I think my father gave me a camera. He had some old camera he dug up. And I started shooting. And then I uh, ran into a friend of mine. She worked at Canon at the time. And they got these cameras back and refurbished and I went over her house and uh, picked up this camera. I still have it today. And it's been digital, like from, like, I guess, about 2004 to 21. Digital photographs. Like when I ran into Christian, I said, look, man, I've got assets. I'm willing to contribute photos, video. My sister kept a lot of flyers and, you know, we contribute what we had and, uh, you know, it's been a joy to work on this project with you and Christian. That's awesome. Thank you. And I mean, I mean, I meant to say this earlier. I mean, without people like yourself who are documenting and saving this history, I mean, it would we could lose it and it's it's really kind of like the wind beneath our wings because we couldn't tell these stories without uh without assets like yours like the pictures the flyers the, the if you have any video like right. all that stuff makes us our work possible so hats off to you thank you so much <laughs> for oh, it's, uh, all your contributions it is uh i, I mean it's it's almost like a Twilight Zone episode of house music. You know, I'm at Wayne State. My buddy says buy a camera. It's 1988, 89. And I start shooting. I have no plan to conquer the world or, you know, just I'm doing something that I enjoy. Uh, I love house music. will always love it. So photographing it and video uh taping it it's easy it's fun it's not even work it's just 
a joy. And my aunt and my grandfather taught me the importance of, of history, of knowing your history and, you know, capturing it. Before my grandfather passed away, uh, my grandfather on my father's side, I did a, I had a little tape recorder, I set it on his hospital bed, and I still have that recording. I digitized that. Uh, it's on my laptop. I have it on. I'm going to put, put it back on my uh, flash drive. Sometimes when I'm driving to work, I just turn on my grandfather. And uh, he talks about, you know, old Detroit and the Gotham Hotel and things like that. And, uh, you, know, so, you know, when house music started, you know, it was fun. It was enjoyable. You know, we didn't think, you know, we'd make a movie or a documentary. I mean, we thought about it, you know, but the technology is so much easier now for these young people to document what they're doing. You know, that camera I had was huge <laughs> and the quality was not huge, but uh, I just used it. And lo and behold, Christian and I run into each other in LA and then back here with this project and I meet you through Christian and as they say kind of the rest is history our history so tell me like who else have you kind of like shared this with Will Phelps is the first person who I shot for he was doing the house music scene before we switched over to hip-hop I don't know that was probably when I was out in California but he's got some footage that that he wanted to digitize, but I got to get back from him because I some of this stuff is so old that I can't even remember what's on it until I actually either see the label or see what's actually on this uh, um, footage. But the stuff I have here, you know, I got I guess about eight or nine tapes, a variety of stuff. He's got a couple of tapes I got to get back from him so I can digitize those. But other than that, no one else has seen this. I mean. But Kristen and you and me and and my wife, <laughs> you know, some of the old footage from uh, 246 and I think I shot Stacy Hill at, she was playing one night at Cobo Hall. Other than that, this footage has not been seen in, since I shot it, really. Because I, I carried it around and never, I may have taken it out and stuck it in a VCR when I was living in LA, just to, you know, look at it, you know, just to kind of flash back and reminisce. But other than that, that's, uh, that's about it. But uh, I got some more stuff I got to send them. Because uh, when I digitized, I wasn't looking at it, you know, minute for minute, I was kind of doing something else and coming back and making sure it was still being uh, transferred but um i really don't know how much i have until i get get my tapes back from uh will so tell me more about some of the djs that that you have photos of i guess let's start off with some of the ones who are not here like aaron carl big rob carlo simpson uh, ray berry uh, i have ray berry and al esther playing I don't know if it was a New Year's Eve, some back in 89 or 90. Tony Hunter used to play for uh Will Phelps, Stacy, uh Vernell Bird, Powder Blue, Minx, Delano Norm, Al, uh Martinez Brothers, um, Mike Grant, Kevin Saunderson, obviously, Juan Atkins, John Collins, Osalande, Dennis Ferrer. Derek May, DJ Sneak, Donna Edwards, Eric Johnson, Greg Gray, Jihad Muhammad, Carl Craig, Bruce Bailey, quite a few. Wow, that's, that's impressive. And, and so you, you sound like you're organized. Well, you know what? I had to get organized because this stuff was accumulating. I said, Emmett, you got to make a list. So I can know, I mean, I've got two computers. I got my old one, which has got a lot of the stuff on it. 
and I got my, you know, my laptop, which I'm on right now. And uh, I said, I got to make list to keep track of this. And between the time you got off the, our first conversation, I was able to recall a couple of more names that I had not on my, I didn't have on my list. So it's like about 85 people. And I think it's, I think it may be closer, Jennifer, to 100. Because my list says 2002 to 2014. Now it's 2021. Obviously, I have not been out like I have in those early years. But I would still go out, grab some shots on my phone. But I mean, 85, almost 90 people, DJs. I started shooting photographs when I got back to Detroit from LA and Texas. See, the video was before I left when I was at Wayne State. The photos have been shot since I've been back to Detroit. It's like the, the early days of video and VHS. And uh, we're getting back here with the photography and you know some video clips on the phone, but now I have this new 5G phone, which the camera quality is just mind blowing for the video. I mean, the VHS camera I had does not even come close to this telephone. <laughs> you know, it just shows you the difference in the technology from those early days of 88, 89 to now. And not only can I capture video clips with this phone, the sound quality is good because I was a sound guy when I worked at Black Entertainment TV. Yeah, this is also fascinating. Why is it important for young people to be taking pictures, recording videos, and most importantly, archiving the content around cultural movements they are part of? Well, here's the thing. Your history is very important. And sometimes when you're young, you're making history and you don't realize it. When the house scene started, I don't think anybody was thinking about archives and films and documentaries. 15, 20, 30 years down the road. Now, with all the information that's out there, access to it, the sharing of it, whatever you're doing, if you're painting, playing music, if you're DJing, if you're making music, if you're promoting music, you're probably making history and don't realize. It. You know, having uh, people in my family who stressed education and arts. My aunt is an actress turned writer and her dad, my grandfather, were very big on knowing your history, documenting, you know, re recording what you can and telling a story somewhere in your life or one or two or three stories. And nowadays, I think we could inject that into young people early on in their lives. So when they get involved in, in something and say, hey, okay, you know, Karen, you, you shoot camera tonight. And then when we do our thing next weekend, Mike shoots camera, you know, whatever it is, you know, basketball, violin, house music, DJing, dancing, whatever it is, young people can record it early on, much more so than we could. Or at least I, you know, I'm older than you, so I mean, you know, like I said, that big old camera I had was, you know, this big. It worked. Uh, here comes some of the footage in the project. So, I mean, you never know. Uh, you never know how special something is sometimes when you're inside of it. Sometimes it takes years, decades and you step outside of it and you say, wow. When I look back on DJing, me and my buddies would talk about this all the time later on. And he always thought he was into computer science. He went to Cast Tech. And uh, we were all trying to be DJs back in the day. Everybody wanted to be a DJ. You know, the girls, the music, the lights. You know, it was just positive. It was good. It was clean fun. And he always talked about how the technology he said, Emmett, we were born a little too soon. And I understand what he meant by that because years later, I mean, you know, you know, this stuff is 
everywhere. You know, this dub deck I had, which is 30 plus years old, still works. But when I got that, that was like, you know, holy grail. I think I put it on a credit card, you know, but now as a young person, you can say, look, we are special and what we're doing is special. Yeah, you may think it's just softball, but let's say you go to the championship. Did you document it for your, your aunts and uncles and your grandparents? Oh, we were just playing softball. Well, not really. So I think nowadays we could inject that into young people say, hey, document what you're doing. Record it. You never know what may happen. Well, thank you for doing all that you've done and your contributions to the film. Man, I am so glad that we got a chance to have a conversation with Emmett Nicholas. That was awesome. So that song that played is called Angel Eyes, the remix on the Prism label, P-R-I-S-M, Prism label. Yes, back in 1983. This was one of those records that was very popular. That's one of my old uh, records from back in the day. I mean, like when I was a DJ at 15, 16 years old, man, if you didn't have that record in your crate and if you uh, were not playing that record uh, on your mixtape, then it was a problem. That was a record that you had to have. I mean, you just could not go without it. So next Guys, we will hear our conversation, meaning the conversation that I have with my teammates, Jennifer Washington and David Grandison, about the words that you heard from photographer Emmett Nicholas. Let's get into it. So it's funny. He was calling the one particular club 246 and I, I knew what he was talking about. And then later in the interview, he called it what most people called it, which was 246. And 246 was this hole in the wall club across from the Detroit Athletic Club, I believe, uh, that was on a Thursday night run by uh, Mr. Bruce Bailey, who is one of Detroit's finest DJs and entrepreneurs and you know Bruce was or and has been running the scene in Detroit for a long time uh but 246 man oh my god the 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 vibe the energy um I mean it was it was incredible and 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 he's right the point that he made about um you weren't thinking about documenting that stuff and recording and taking pictures you know back then it was all about the moment for us you know which leads me to uh the point that he also made that um you know it's a good thing that we're doing this documentary uh that we have people that at least saw the importance of uh filming and 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 taking pictures because you know, this documentary is, it's, it's bigger than the personalities that are in this documentary. You know what I mean? Like this is shit that generations and generations from now will be able to, to, to witness how important Detroit was or is to, to, uh, to techno, you know, um, you know, like, like, like they say, you know, uh, uh, people that, don't know their history are lost, you know? And so that's why it's so important for us to get this film out and let the world know 
uh, the significant role Detroit has played and continues to play um, uh, in dance music. Yeah, man. Like what you just said is is really important. And I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down. I'm gonna get scientific on you. Um, All right. Let's think go. about what it is that we're working with now. And this is something I tell young people when I'm, uh, you know, we, we talk about it in Detroit Techno 101. But when I'm speaking to, you know, classes of kids, you know, I, I try to let them know that when we store something, the medium that we store it on is important to know. Okay. Hmm. Think about it. What we stored our content on when all of us were kids, that medium is reaching its half-life, the mm. point at which it degrades and will die. It's gone. Mm. Okay, so like cats like Emmett are the reason that we're able to tell this story. And so we're trying to catch them right now. Why? Because he's shooting on VHS tapes and Jennifer was able to track him down. VHS tapes have a lifespan of 10 to 20 years. Mm-hmm. It's VH tapes are, are not, um, they won't live forever. And mm-hmm. I've talked to other guys that I work with in the video industry, and we're all going through the process of trying to digitize our VHS tapes because they're at the end of their lifespan, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. It's like when that, when these tapes die, when the magnetic particles disappear, it's gone. So films like what we're working on, capturing this VHS material and archiving it with context is the only thing that's going to keep these stories alive that we're, you know, that we're telling DV tapes 20 years. Okay. I shot, um, in 1999 on DV. Okay. Um, the, the movement festival, a lot of the footage that's in the film. Okay. It's at the end of its lifespan. And so I've digitized it, but you know, when I get called up and and Christian or or Jennifer's like, yo, we need this. I'm like, okay. And I got to go back and redigitize it again. If I don't have that already digitized because it's, it's gone, it's going to be gone. So, you know, we got to remember, we got to tell young people, Hey, you're shooting now on 4k video footage and that's great, but you need to be archiving. You need to name it correctly. You need to make sure that you're taking the time to back it up. And you're not just pushing it to the cloud so that it's deleted later. And that's really what Detroit Techno 101 is about, is we're trying to teach people that you're not only filming what's happening around you, okay, but you need to film it with the mindset that you're going to want to find it later, not just the garbage. I'm going to shoot it. If it doesn't go on social, it's getting trashed because you might have been a witness to something really unique and something that was important to the culture that you're in. So why not make a short film about it, upload it to a place like um, YouTube or Vimeo, where it's going to be there, name it correctly, add the metadata that's needed and own it. Because in 20 years, it'll still be there in many cases. Yes, yes, absolutely. Nice. Hmm. So yeah, man, I, I love it. Jennifer, you know, what you said was good. You know, what, what your questions were great and, and what he provided us was mm-hmm. was awesome. You know, he's, he really he broke down the reason that he was there. He was witnessing, he didn't know it was history, but it became history. Right. And I, I like, love, none of us know that. It. Yeah, I, I, I love that point he made. You know, sometimes when you're, when you are in the middle of it, you just, you're just not aware, you know, of what that situation could become you know um he made some really really good points and uh, brought up uh you know a lot of great memories i know some of the djs that he mentioned um you know we're all familiar with uh you know ray berry um and i will forever lift up his name because you know as a young dj coming up in detroit ray berry was like one of um uh, my heroes you know, uh, Ray Berry, then next would be uh, Steve Dunbar. He mentioned uh, Al Esther, you know, Al Esther, um, great, great DJ. Um, love watching him uh, DJ. Um, you know, Al used to do our college parties uh, when I was a young man. So, you know, all these great DJs, man, 
that he named in Detroit that have con- that have uh, contributed to the scene and continue to contribute to the scene. The the heroes that we had from the past that uh, some of them we have lost, but you know, like. Like David said, that's why it's important to continue to mention these people's names, to document this stuff so that long after, you know, we have made our transition that, you know, there will hopefully be young people behind us who will find this information and, and, and become interested in it and maybe even take it further, you know, and. I, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's really what it's all about, you know, leaving some type of legacy, uh, some type of roadmap in which you can learn from, you know, and because, and, you know, these young people, they're 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 smart, you know. And so, you know, my son, he's a film student and, you know, I used to always and still do. Um you know, talk to him about how important, you know, getting your content together and putting it out there and sharing it with people. And, and, and that's, that's what it's, that's what it's all about, man. You know, that's what it's all about, especially this music thing, you know, which, which breaks down all kind of barriers, man. You know, uh, you know, this, like, you, like uh, Emmett mentioned, you know, we, none of us knew that this music would, would, would take off like it did. And, 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 you know, even the, the, the brothers who created this genre of techno said it themselves, you know, they're like, shit, we didn't know um, it was going to take off like this, you know, but, you know, I just think when you have something, when you have something special, you know, and other people see it as special, then, you know, it just kind of takes on a life of its own. And that's what techno did. Detroit techno did, you know? Yeah, man. You know, you, you just broke something down, you know, and, and, you know, the quote you just, like you started off talking about was he said, and I wrote it down. That was why it, it, it affected me so much that he said, you never know how something is special until it's over. Mm. Okay. Like that sums up why we're working on this project. Okay. Yes. Like we, don't know and the the key is we're teaching young people to recognize that if you're in a moment like right now everybody got their phone up they're in that moment but they realize something cool is happening the problem is they're not documenting it and archiving it so that Mm -hmm. it can be found later they're just in the moment okay we got it we got it. it's gonna it's gonna get wiped every 30 days as things go on but we got to realize this is something really special let's save it let's put a name to it let's add some metadata around it so that it can be found let's put it somewhere where it's gonna be forever and you know i'm recognized as a person who created it if you don't do that you can't own anything and social facebook will own it you won't own it Mm. on social instagram will own it you don't own it unless you make sure you've tagged in a way you know that, that it is, and that, again, that's what we hope to do in Detroit Techno 101: is teach people how to document their history, document what they're doing, document mm-hmm. it smartly, and document it in a way that's going to allow it to be found by people in the future and named what they want to name it, not named what somebody else wants to name it, mm-hmm. named what they want to name it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's important. You know, I'm gonna add one more thing. You know, he mentioned somebody that we haven't talked about very much as a part of this project. He mentioned Aaron Carl. Mm, okay. Yes. yes okay. Absolutely. You know, come on. Really, absolutely. we got to give Aaron some love. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> you know, down. <laughs> you know, like I remember right. hearing right. you know tracks like that, and I was like, "What?" And I didn't know till he passed away that that was Detroit yeah. music. Yeah. Like yeah. that hurts absolutely. my heart. You know, I I, I think Aaron Carl was probably one of the most um, overlooked and underrated Detroit artists ever. Um, I remember when Eddie pulled me in to Eddie folks pulled me in to um, do a residency with him. Uh, in Detroit, one of the first DJs that I wanted to bring in was Aaron Carl. And, you know, one of the biggest regrets that I have in my career is not 
being able to work with that brother before he left this planet because we had a conversation about us coming together and collaborating because I, I could I could see his genius, man. I could see his genius and and he was so talented and and a brilliant DJ uh, and a great guy overall. Um, but I, that's another name that um, I, I need to lift up. Like you said, more often, um, he made some great music. Um, um, one of the tracks I still run uh, of his um, and, and, and the brother, it, not only was he a great DJ, but, uh, he could sing his ass off. <laughs> he had a great singing voice, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and that's what, uh, we were trying to, we were going to come together on is, is him, uh, you know, uh, doing some, uh, some singing. Um, but yeah, man. Yeah. Um, wow. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know you had interacted with him, you know, and again, you know, it's like, we got to give love to these underground, these guys in the underground while, you know, we may not have captured them as part of the film, but the podcast, we're, we're going to, we're going to give them the flowers in the podcast. Okay. We're going to, we're going to let the people know that there's the, there's a whole circle of people who supported the pillars of what we call Detroit techno. Mm. And, you know, we got to document that history because a lot of them left, you know, Aaron Carl was done at 37, young, yes. Yes. young, yes. Yes. you know? And, and so like, you know, what you're saying is like, I didn't even know you had interacted with them, but mm-hmm. the talent interacted in Detroit. Like we networked, people networked, the industry networked. And, you know, so, yeah, let's give Aaron his love, you know, like among all the other people like, you know, Ray and like Al Esther, you know, Al Esther running in the DIA right now, Christian's film on Mm -hmm. Al Esther and, you know, the start of Technomecca at the at the beginning of the project, you know, um, you know, Delano Mix, you know, Osun Lade again got you know Osun Lade gave love to our project early on we got to give him some love he may not Absolutely. be in the final cut but I'm gonna shout him out right now Osun yeah. Lade's for real this is a house legend Yoruba priest breaking house down Reggie yeah. you know what he, I'm talking right. about right he, he's you know <laughs> Osun Lade is by far one of the most respected house DJs and producers, underground house DJs and producers in the world. His label, Yoruba Records, is 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 at the top, probably in the top 10 when it comes to the top uh, house music uh, labels. And and yes, Asun Lade, he 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 loves Detroit. You know, um, he has played Detroit on many occasions and uh, but definitely uh, a, a big, big uh, shout out uh, to that brother. And he too is, is, is a great brother as well. He's in your archive, right, Dave? Asun You have you an interview know it. with him? You know it. I mm-hmm. spent the day with Asun and mm-hmm. it was incredible. And, you know, maybe, you know, we're, we're going to pull it out. These are the type of pieces that we're going to pull out and we'll be sharing them with you in some way and we'll let you know. But yeah, Ocean Lade, you know, gave me a wonderful interview and and, and again, he did. He's giving this interview because I said I'm doing a film on Detroit. Mm-hmm. Y'all need to, you know, recognize. Okay, like Detroit gets respect in that way. And so when we mm-hmm. say we're trying to document the history of Detroit and Detroit you know, African Americans and electronic music in general, with a focus on Detroit, people are like, oh okay, let's do this. Mm-hmm. And that's the type of uh, guy he is. Like I reached out to him. He didn't know me from Adam and he spent mm-hmm. the entire day with me and we took time for that, you know? So, so I just say that, yeah, Jennifer, you're right. We have that in the archives and, and we'll be pulling those things out as nuggets for, um, for, for people to, to see in and around the launch of this project. That's awesome. That's awesome. Awesome. Do you guys, um, do you want to talk about, because I think we got a lot of good stuff for this so far. Yes. Your commentary was great, guys. Um, You guys always come through. Um, I think the interview 
you know, he had a lot on his own. He was so easy, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't even have to, you know, really <laughs> refer right. to anything because he was just so generous and forthcoming, you know, and had thought, or you could tell he thought about this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jen, like yeah, I was, you know, he really broke down the history and from the perspective of somebody who's just documenting casually, like mm-hmm. I always, I went into it thinking that it would be documented and I would do something with it as a, as a producer. Whereas he went into it from the fact that this is something special. I need to document that. And not only did he look at it like it was something special, but he archived it and he's taken it place to place. That's important. So, you know, I'm, I'm telling everybody, like he's an example of someone who recognizes art when he sees it and realizes that he needs to capture it. And that's what we're trying to teach young people. You know, as a part of our Detroit Techno 101 is you need to, if you know something special and you think it's special, it doesn't matter if you're the only person sitting in the audience, you pull your camera out, capture it, document it, name it, put it on the web, share it, you know, like, like that's mm-hmm. really what it's about, you mm-hmm. know, and he was the epitome of that. And now we're calling him because he's one of the few people who can actually cre- give us content that actually speaks to the era that we're trying to make this film about. So this next record is a pure classic. I still run it. That record is Voodoo Ray. Yes, Voodoo Ray, produced by a guy called Gerald. Let's go. Today's episode will be some final words of our own archives. Let's get it. Like, of course, I have tapes that I recorded off my stereo and I used to dub too because me and my brother would go up to Byright and my brother was, he he got an allowance. I didn't get an allowance. And so we would go up to Byright with his allowance and he would get all the new stuff and then I would go home and I would um, record um, duplicates for all my friends from what we bought at Buy Right. And so I have, you know, a collection of those um, in, in like mixes from the mix shows. Um, I have that as mm-hmm. well as um, the past couple of years, I've been buying stuff up off of eBay. I've been buying a lot of vinyl um, some artwork. I have this one piece from Abdul Haq. Um, he did um, like some artwork for one of maybe a couple of ones um, albums. So, and I have um, magazines. I was able to get some magazines and some really cool like promo pieces of vinyl with like Juan and um, Blake. And just some in 45s, you know, so one day I'm going to make it available for everybody to see. Wow. You know, you mentioned Abdul Haq. Okay. We had that. We haven't spoken to him about it. We haven't spoken about him in this podcast. Okay. Abdul Haq, the techno futurist artist who defined you are album art defined, you know, like you know, how many how many different artists did he cover in terms of creating what the Afro futurist look was? Abdul Haq mm. is that guy. We interviewed him. We have him 
we have him locked. You know, uh, I got out Abdul Haq sitting, you know, on on the steps of Submerge. OK, <laughs> you know, and he nice, spoke to yeah. us. And, you know, I had to give reverence to this cat because he's the cat who gave us what Drexler could look like, gave us what, uh, you know, what, what the look of you are was. Uh, you know, he, he did. Metroplex, he did. Like, how much? Reggie, come on, help me out. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that, that's it. That's it. I mean, that, that that's the definition of uh, techno right there. Metroplex, you know, you are underground resistance. Yeah. And yeah. it's funny because you, you you never think about that, you know. He basically defined their look, how they were presented to the world, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why. That's crazy. That's, you know, like we crazy. we gotta we gotta talk to these people, capture mm-hmm. their stories, mm-hmm. let them tell what they do, let them tell what their art is all about, you know. Because like, come on, think about it. Who would have thought about you know the story that he's telling about a track that appears on that white label that's on that track? Like, yo, we, white labels. Okay, we all know white labels. It tells you nothing about mm-hmm. the story. But if you got a track that's got an interesting image. What's the story behind that image? Right. That's what these types of films that we're doing is about. Right. What's the story? Why did you put that on that image? You know, nude photo. Okay. Right. We know what that image looked like. Right. <laughs> In my right. head, it's burned into my head. I know. Right. Like, right. you know, then these, you know, that wasn't Abdul, but you know, again, like those are the type of images, you know, that, that are important. Drexia, I, I, I could in my mind kind of see where right. that comic book is this this is topic future you know these these slaves that um that 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 ended up giving birth underwater okay Mm -hmm. and this is a story Mm -hmm. that isn't a you are story but he's the only one who had a little bit and gave you a tiny hint of what you are story was behind the tracks Mm -hmm. because you are doesn't try to tell you anything they're like you figure it out Right. You know, so like right. Abdul is the key holder as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, Jennifer, right. you don't don't get me started because right. it's so important for us to capture the stories of these people, and we have it. We will be rolling it out, and we will be sharing what we have as a part of the rollout for this film. So uh, you know, stay tuned. Yes. So, so as as far as documenting documenting um, or archiving history. Um, you know, since I'm into music, mine is from a vinyl perspective. So I have here um, a record called Angel Eyes, right? Um, which was a very popular record in Detroit. And if you didn't have this record, it was on the prison. It was on the uh, prison <laughs> record label. Fire. And uh, this was a really popular record, and 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 this shit fire nineteen. I'm I'm reading off the label, guys. Nineteen eighty three. Th- this is the copy that I have. Wow, nineteen. That's a classic, brother. Yeah, and and and, and this is uh, a huge classic, man. If you didn't have Angel Eyes on a mixtape as a DJ coming up as a kid, <laughs> uh, you were you, you were lame. Yeah, you're breaking it down. And in here, I'm going to toss one little bit on that. Audio tapes only last about 20, uh, 30 years. Okay, so right now, we're at the end life of audio tapes. Digitize mm-hmm. your digitize your stuff. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Angel eyes. I love that. You yeah. know, you got to rock that. Yeah. And then, then I have a, another classic, um, um, uh, Voodoo Ray. <laughs> guy, a guy called Gerald. Exactly. Another, Another London person artist. that you interviewed, right? Blessed us. Yes. Blessed yes. us. Yes. It blessed us so many times. We gotta give we gotta give a guy called yeah. Gerald, you know, love. This, this, 808 this, state. You know, this, we forget. I the, <laughs> the 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 uh year on this one. Um this looks like it may have been eighty eight uh, uh, a reissue. So it was like this has nineteen ninety six, but this record is is yeah way it's late eighties. Yeah, it's late eighties. This this, this this record was hugely popular too in Detroit. 
fire uh, in, in, in the eighties. Yeah. 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 And, and, and Guy Caldrell gives us love. Okay. He, he understood that Detroit techno was where he got a lot of influences and he took it, he took it, he took it as big as Kevin Saunderson did, you know, he took it as big as inner city and he gives us love for the origins of it. Like, you know, and that's important. And he, and I, we saw him at a, the last big promo we did in Detroit. He was mm-hmm. there. He came. Right. I right. was, sure I did. lost my, I, I, I was like, what? Guy, yeah. guy called Gerald. How the hell did you find out that we were doing a promo at Spectacles? Right. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, right. how did you know? He's like, I just happened to be in the D. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that techno radar, man. Yeah. <laughs> the techno radar. <laughs> I know I still haven't been able to really process that that you know I do I saw the picture so I'm, I remember he was there and it was pretty yeah. awesome but I haven't it was such a um there was so much going on that weekend so much work to do and um but now this is like a moment we can take to really like thank God our, our lucky stars that we had somebody like a legend like that and what at, I mean he went he didn't just show up at spectacles where we had the um, meet and greet but he came to the later screening too mm, he um, sure did yeah sure remember did. Mm-hmm. absolutely yeah. he 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 supported us all weekend long mm-hmm. uh, you know for me like that really touched my heart because mm-hmm. he was the one of the first cats who was on the techno mecca trailer you can find that on mm-hmm. on on right. gsg edm you can find it on our uh on, you know musicorigins.com but the techno mecca trailer like that was the first time anybody edited that stuff together and thought it was and called it something and said that we were gonna make a film about it he's mm-hmm. the cat there mm-hmm. co-signing for the d from london <laughs> you know like so right. he gets big props as far as absolutely. i'm concerned absolutely you know i didn't have to i didn't have to prompt him he was like oh what detroit i'm here at the movement festival because detroit is the mecca you know and he went on so yeah mm-hmm. they'll get me yeah like gerald gets all love for right. me because his music is 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 an imprint that comes from you know the the vein of house music that is deep that is underground absolutely yeah, and he brought merch too. So he, he's a <laughs> big supporter. Yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer said, not only, not only was he giving us love, but he supported, and that's what's up, right? You know, I me, mean, right. come on. You know, we're we're indie filmmakers. So, you know, that's that's you know, you want to support us, go to the site, gsgedm.com, and yes. please pick up some merch. You know, just yeah. a little bit of love helps us out. You know, because we're still trying to get 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 licensing. It ain't gonna be cheap to make this film. <laughs> we we still trying to make sure that we take care of everybody who's got a track that gets played on this film. And right. that's what's taking right. so long. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We will get there. So guys, that last record, again, was Voodoo Ray, produced by a guy called Joe, right? So this brother has been a supporter of Detroit artists, of Detroit techno, of Detroit for a long, long time. He always shows us love in the D when it comes to this electronic music thing. So that record is a classic and again i still run that record that record still gets people excited on the dance floor so guys we just want to thank you thank you thank you for just supporting us and and just being with us you know on this journey of god said give them drum machines podcast so you know all these folks around the world have been supporting us, but we want to specifically shout out New Delhi, uh, Clancilla, and uh, Hutchison. We see you and appreciate your support. And, you know, we appreciate, again, all of you for um, supporting us. And we just need for you to continue to support us on our journey uh, in this independent filmmaking process. Oh, you know, also, I want to give a, give a shout out to uh, Kat in New York and Maddie in California. 
Don't forget, people, that you can go to the God Said Give Them Drum Machines website. So that would be gsgedm.com forward slash shop. We still have a 20% off on new merch. Please go check it out. It's some really cool stuff. Also, want to give a shout out uh, to the EPM music team. Oliver, Addy, and Jonas. Special shout out to Output, the sound design company out of LA. Thank you for supplying me with those uh, great sounds to uh, help bring this documentary to life. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also, we can't forget, got to give a special and big thanks to Fusicology, our girl Asia and Amy at Fuse Ecology. We appreciate you both so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So stay updated with us on Facebook and Instagram at God said, give them drum machines. You know, we can't wait to, uh, you know, share with you guys uh, this film. Remember that um, you can catch all of our podcast episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever streaming platform where you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Okay. Thanks again, guys. Thanks for joining us on this episode. We'll see you next month. God said, give them drum machines.